let's uh, see what it has to say. That was the perception of cessation. Uh, the next one is the perception of dissatisfaction with the whole world. And uh, this is what I mentioned before, the Samba, Loke, Anabirata, Sanya, this is what this is. Uh, and uh, so what, what does that mean? And it means the following. Uh, it's when a mendicant lives giving up and not grasping on to the attraction and grasping to the world. The mental fixation, insistence, and underlying tendencies. Uh, this is called the perception of dissatisfaction with the whole world. Uh, so in other words, you, are, you lose your interest in the world. That's really what it means. Sabba loke anabirati sanya. And uh, so what, what does that mean? Well, it means many of the things that I have been talking about before during this retreat. Yeah, The idea that uh, in the world, when we talk about the world, the world can mean many things in the Pali language. Loka is the Pali word for world. And just like in English, the word world means many things. It's exactly the same thing in Pali. So the world, it can mean like the earth. Yeah, That means usually the, the world. The world can also mean like humanity. If you say the whole world says, and you mean all of humanity says. The world can also mean like the universe. Yeah, The whole world can mean the, mean the kind of larger world in that sense. So it has many, many different meanings. Now, one of the meanings that is special in the Pali is that the word world can sometimes refer to karma loka, in other words, the world of the five senses. And uh, this is uh, the main meaning in this particular context, yeah, the world of the five senses. Uh, and so you have the perception of dissatisfaction with that world. Uh, and uh, so this is just understanding the impermanence of that world, the unreliability of that world, the uncertainty of that world, the uh, uh, certainty of uh, suffering in that world there's always going to be dukkha in that world and this is what that means yeah and so we i mentioned this a lot before about how in, you know looking at how the world is always changing and how unreliable everything is and all of these kind of things and so this is really comes back to that so i think i will not go into any more details because i've spoke, talked about this uh, quite a bit already uh, but we can always uh, bring it up again if you like yeah. Next one, what is the perception of impermanence of all conditions? So first of all, I will uh, uh, point out that conditions here is sankara. And I don't think it is a good translation, conditions, because to me, condition is uh, really a, a cause of something else. And here, here the word really means all phenomena. So I would say the perception of impermanence in all phenomena, I think, is a better translation and that gives, gives the meaning more clearly, in my opinion. Yeah. So what is that perception of impermanence uh, in all phenomena? It is when a mendicant is horrified, repelled, and disgusted with all phenomena. This is called the perception of impermanence in all phenomena. Whoa. That's very powerful, isn't it? Yeah. And... Uh, so uh, this is a bit different from what we normally think about impermanence, uh, but uh, this is the consequence uh, of impermanence. Uh, the consequence of seeing impermanence is that you turn away from those things that are impermanent, uh, because things that are impermanent are by their very nature also going to be suffering. Uh, so you turn away from those things. That's, this is what it means here to be horrified, repelled, and disgusted, is that you can't, can't bear it anymore. Uh, you have an aversion towards all phenomena, and you just turn away because of that. Uh, that's kind of um, remarkable, isn't it? Uh, and it's really hard to really understand even what that means in a sense. What does it mean? How can you have disgust with all phenomena? What, what is all phenomena anyway? What is all phenomena? Sorry? Exactly right, yeah? So, yeah, so this, this is uh, why... Yin says all phenomena means everything. That's exactly what it means. But it's kind of really hard to really kind of get your head around how you can have a dis be disgusted with everything, isn't it? Uh, that's really what it is saying. Uh, the only thing you're not disgusted with is Nibbana. And the reason you're not disgusted with Nibbana is because Nibbana is not a phenomenon. Uh, yeah, that's how you can be di not disgusted with that. Uh, so your mind turns towards cessation, turns towards non-desire, turns towards Nibbana, 
all of these things we saw before. This is peaceful, this is sublime, right? Etang santang, etang panitang. This is what you turn towards. So all of these things that we've been talking about, seeing impermanence, etc., it leads up to this point. But uh, as you can see, it is, it is quite, so it has a lot of, uh, it has powerful consequences, these kind of reflections uh, that take you a very long way on this path. Uh, this is a very unusual phrasing that you find here. This is not found anywhere else in the suttas. Uh, and so you, you wonder sometimes when something is only found in one place, uh, it is a little bit kind of... Uh, Uncertain, yeah. We should never go by those things found in only one place. Uh, but I think it is maybe it is within ballpark of the possible. But it sounds a little bit strong to me, to be honest. Uh, but uh, anyway, it is there. Okay. Ready for the next one? Yeah. Okay. Next one coming up. What is, ah, now we come to the mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So uh, mindfulness of breathing is uh, going to come up anyway. We're going to come up, come to that tomorrow, probably. Is anyone here who's not going to be here tomorrow? Not going to be here tomorrow? This is it? Are you sure you want to, you don't, this is your last day today? Is it? Uh, really? This is your chance to, to stay on, yeah, not to go. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Come in every gather when you can. Okay, great. But yeah. So I don't think I will do the mindfulness of breathing now because we're going to go through it in great detail tomorrow. And uh, we're going to have to be doing it twice, which is not really so useful. Uh, this is the last perception of the Giri Mananda Sutta. And uh, this is one of the, to me, one of the most interesting expressions of meditation practice found in the suttas, uh, the mindfulness of breathing. So we will uh, look at that later on. So I'm just going to pass through it very quickly. Breathing, breathing this way, breathing that way, yeah. breathing in, breathing out. Uh, bliss, experiencing all kinds of things. Uh, wow, so much breathing. Okay. Then we come to the very end of the sutta, yeah, when you develop all of these perceptions. Uh, if you were to recite to the mendicant Giri Mananda these ten perceptions, uh, it is possible that after hearing them, his illness will die down on the spot. Yeah? So the Buddha has just taught these ten perceptions to Venerable Ananda. And he has such an amazing memory, Venerable Ananda. He's able to memorize almost anything. Yeah? This is kind of what is really amazing by Venerable Ananda. He's the number one memory in the entire Sangha. Um, and he is, uh, we talk about the Agasavaka, the peak disciples, the best disciples. He's the Agasavaka when it comes to memory, when it comes to sati. Uh, then Ananda, having learned these ten perceptions from the Buddha himself, uh, went to Girimananda and recited them. And after Girimananda heard these ten perceptions, uh, his illness died down on the spot. Uh, and that is how he recovered from that illness. Uh, this is how these things become paritta chants. Yeah? They become a chance we do to, even in the present day, to help people overcome from illness. So, so um, there you are. Um, next sutta we're going to have a look at is the uh, Duttiya Sanya Sutta, the perceptions, uh, which is basically the second, the second sutta on perceptions. Uh, this is found in the uh, uh, Anguttarik Nikaya, the numerical discourses of the Buddha, the cha seventh chapter on sevens, uh, sutta number 49. Um, let's go through the first one, just to have a quick look, so we get an idea how this perception, how the sutta works. Let's at least have a look at the start. Uh, and the Buddha says, uh, mendicants, so more perceptions, right? Perceptions, perceptions. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, these seven perceptions, when developed and cultivated, are very fruitful and beneficial. They culminate in the deathless or in the freedom from death, and they end with the freedom from death. What seven? Yeah, so um, again, it shows you the importance of the development of perception on the Buddhist path. Yeah, 
they take you all the way to the very end of the path. And again, it's very important to realize when the Buddha says something is very fruitful and beneficial, he doesn't mince his words. That means that they are basically take you all the way to the end of the path. That's usually what that means. And so they culminate in the deathless, the amarana or amata. And uh, that is always the expression in the suttas for the end of the path. They have the freedom from death. I don't like the idea of deathless so much, uh, because when you hear, hear a word like deathless, it sounds like a thing. It sounds like a state, yeah? The deathless state or the deathless quality. The, your mind goes beyond death and you achieve something like that. Uh, but it doesn't really mean that. It, what it means is that you are liberated from dying. In other words, you make an end of the round of rebirth. Yeah, that's kind of the idea here. Uh, and if you look at the way it is used in the sutta we looked at before, which was the, uh, uh, the uh, Arya Pariyasana Sutta, the Sutta on the Noble Search. Yeah? Do you remember that sutta? Yeah, it seems like a long time ago now, but it's, not, it's only a few days ago. But uh, when you go through so many suttas, it seems like, wow, this, that's a long time ago. Um, uh, but in that sutta, we looked at the Buddha before his awakening, the Buddha-to-be. And we saw the contemplations that he did yeah, on death in particular, and then he said that, well, when I am subject to dying, I should seek for the amata. Yeah? And of course, in that case, it doesn't mean a deathless state. It means a freedom from that problem. I have the problem of dying. I should look for the freedom from that problem. And that is kind of the obvious meaning in that particular place. So it culminates in the liberation from the problem, which is the, uh, uh, the dying itself. So uh, that is um, fascinating how this idea of freedom from dying is so important in the suttas, yeah? and how that was the main motivating factor for the Buddha in many ways. Uh, and it shows uh, the kind of power of these kind of contemplations. So, so what are the seven? So let's have a quick look at what the seven are. Summary of the sutta. The perception of ugliness. Uh, we have seen that already, yeah? the asubhasanya. The perception of death, marana sanya. We have discussed that a little bit uh, on and off. Maybe we can look at that a little bit more. We'll see what happens. Uh, perception of the repulsiveness of food. Ahara patikula sanya. Don't recommend that too much either. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to have, if you want to enjoy the nice lunch afterwards, don't do that now. Then do that. Do the after lunch instead, and then we can do that. <laughs> so you have to be wise in, in when to use this particular. Uh, particular perceptions. Uh, then you have dissatisfaction with the whole world, which we just have just looked at already, just now. The perception of impermanence that we have also looked at. So you can see many things here are duplicated. Uh, but then we have the perception of suffering in impermanence. Uh, we haven't really looked at that quite yet. Uh, so we look at that in a little bit more detail. And then you have the perception of not-self uh, in suffering. Uh, that's another kind of interesting one, yeah, which we haven't looked at, at before. Uh, so these are the seven, uh, and these seven, when they are done properly, they culminate in the freedom of, from death, uh, the very end of the Buddhist path. Uh, so uh, that is uh, what you have to look forward to, or uh, depends on, your, on how you think about this. Um. Yeah, these seven perceptions, when developed and cultivated, are very fruitful and beneficial. They culminate in the deathless and end with the deathless. And then the sutta begins. When the perception of ugliness is developed and cultivated, it is very beneficial, fruitful and beneficial. It culminates in the deathless and ends with the deathless. That is what I said. But why did I say it? So uh, don't look ahead in your papers, uh, because then uh, the kind of the... You know, tension goes out of this, uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna leave it there because now time is already running out. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into this, uh, but this is kind of setting it up for after the after lunch or two o'clock, uh, and then we'll get into the details of these seven perceptions there. Uh, um, but uh, maybe let's do a little bit more meditation together, and then some final questions. Then we can uh, break for lunch afterwards. Uh. Okay, yeah. so any um, last comments or questions before we uh, take a break? Yeah.
ให้อาจารย์เอา the word culminate do you have another word for it c u l m i n a t e means to same thing as end to end yeah it culminates in it ends in you can see t h e s two words there culminates in ends with her yeah means the same thing in the yeah. first and end with the first yeah so what's the difference culminate We're just two ways of saying the same thing. Oh. Yeah, this, this is very common in the suttas that the Buddha will use uh, different words to mean the same thing. Uh, so it's like syn synonyms, basically. Uh, I see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And you talk about the corpse. Have you ever seen uh, monks? Corpse dry up. No rotten. Um. Yeah, have I seen that? I. I all. Have, I think the most I have seen is like a skeleton sitting in meditation posture because it's been sitting for so long. But it's a similar kind of thing, maybe. Have no, you seen this? Yeah. Okay. No, this Please. is like. Yeah. A, yeah. I I saw two of um, the real one. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, they put it in a glass. Coffin, but his body just dry up, not rotten anything, and they didn't okay. do any starving or, or anything yeah. like that. Okay, it's interesting. The you know all the everything just dry up. I yeah. even touched him. Where where, <laughs> where was this? In it's in the south. One in the south yeah. Yeah. in the uh, yeah. the The other one uh, in uh, uh, Surin. So, okay. Yeah. How did they explain that? Did was there an explanation to go with it, or was it just a no? Yeah. Just, you know, they are very uh, uh, good in uh, meditation, yeah. like a meditation teacher. Okay. And maybe it's some you know <laughs> some yeah. good side effect of it yeah. of uh, the of the practice. Okay. Mm. But it's very interesting. You know how you explain in a medical term or yeah. something like that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And every yeah. every year they change the role. Yeah. And at that time, I I was there, and why they changed the role? I even touched his toe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, there's a couple months yeah. uh, changing his role and yeah. put all the sankati and yeah. everything. Is it very? Interesting. It is interesting. I, you know, it reminds me of uh, what happened at the time of the Buddhas when the Buddha passed away. His parinibbana, because just before his parinibbana, he would go into all the eight jhanas, the you know the four jhanas, immaterial attainments. He would go into cessation, the s a n n a v i d a i t a niroda, cessation of perception and feeling. And I, and there's always this question: Why did the Buddha do that before he passed away? Yeah. And I think maybe something similar to what you are saying. Yeah, you when you go into very deep meditation beforehand. It preserves the body because mm -hmm. you are kind of dampening down the uh, metabolism, and metabolism goes yeah. down to zero because you don't uh -huh. breathe anymore. Right. And because of that, I think the body is naturally preserved. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think maybe the Buddha did the same thing so that the, his body wouldn't start rotting or anything like that. It would just keep for a while after he passed away. Uh, you know. So I think maybe that's a similar kind of situation. I wonder. And, uh, and you yeah. know, we went there. It was the s a m i n a r y ordination. Mm. And I was sit, I was sleeping in a, in a room downstairs, and he's up there. <laughs> and that that morning, it's like you know, early in the morning, I heard the chanting, uh -huh. very loud, you know. Okay. But there was no monk there chanting or anything. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I got up and I. You know, when I woke up, I asked you who v e been chanting. He said, "No, nobody was chanting." Yeah. But uh, you know, in my mind, I heard you know very loud chanting. Okay. Like in a, on the speaker, <laughs> very loud. <laughs> so what was it? So what's that? What, what was it? Maybe he, he was trying to yeah. wake us up. <laughs> <laughs> He was a ghost. He was a ghost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of interesting. Interesting. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for those stories. That's great. Yeah. Zom zombie parita. Another <laughs> zombie parita. He was chanting the zombie parita.
<laughs> so that's kind of <laughs> if when a zombie gets sick, you go to the zombie operator. That's right. <laughs> mm. Ajahn, there's yeah. a question on the perception of the impermanence of all phenomena. Here it says, uh, mannequin is horrified with hell and disgusted with all conditions. Hmm. Uh, can Ajahn explain, uh, is there a difference or similarity with uh, craving for non-existence? Mm -hmm. With hell and this craving for non-existence. I think the difference is that um, uh, craving for non-existence is okay. uh, something you do if you are a Putujana, an ordinary person, and you don't really understand the Dhamma properly, uh, because then you want to commit suicide. Like committing suicide is like craving for non-existence, but it doesn't work. Yeah, that's the problem. You commit suicide, and then you come back again. So it's so a little bit kind of tragic if you try to end things in that way. Whereas this is uh, comes from inside, comes from a real understanding. Yeah? And uh, when you have real understanding, you turn away from those things. Uh, and then uh, when you turn away from them, you reach enlightenment, and then the process comes to an end. Uh, and that is the difference. You're not actually craving for anything. Uh, it's just the, the natural consequences of insight instead. Uh, so that's, I would say that's the difference. And then you just things come to you. You understand that craving is not the answer. Yeah, Craving is not the answer to get, getting out of these things. Uh, the answer is to have insight and then allow the process to come to an end. That is the, that is the answer. Uh, yeah, OK. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah. These are very these are very profound things, you know. So they're kind of you know, talking about some very deep things on the on the path here. So it's not not easy to relate to. Why, Yen? Please, sir. Yes, same yeah. one. Um, the horrified, repelled, and disgusted. Yeah. Ati jiguchati. Um, it's actually the three terms that are normally used for adinawa, right? Uh, is it? Uh, it may be right. It probably is. Majima nikaya twenty is. Ah, majima nikaya twenty. Examine the drawbacks of those thoughts. Ah, yeah. An example. Right, yeah. Because that, that's like the simile of the dog around your neck and that kind of thing. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. The good ati ati hai hayati. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So that is kind of the same, same simile as is used for negative, uh, especially bad thoughts of the mind. Yeah. Yeah, I find it, I find, I find it a bit over the top that it is used in this way for all phenomena. It is, it is, and it's the only place in the suttas where that is the case. Uh, so you wonder whether there is some kind of uh, dodginess there, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think 11.58, so maybe time to go. Yeah, so uh, yeah. So let's have a nice lunch, everyone. So see, see what that says.